Who made history? And who created the great civilizations of history? According to China's lunar calendar, January 23rd in the year AD 1403 was New Year's Day in Guiwei year. On this day, people living in the land of China were celebrating as they do every year the most important annual festival, Lunar New Year's Day, a tradition stretching back to ancient times. This time, on the traditional cards similar to the New Year greeting cards that people still receive today, no reference to the rule of Emperor Jianwen was to be seen. After a war called in history the Change of Jinyan, the four-year reign of Emperor Jianwen had come to an end. On Lunar New Year's Day of 1403, the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Di, officially adopted the name Yongle as his title of reign, thus making 1403 the first year of the reign of Emperor Yongle. And along with this change in the title of reign, there were to be yet more changes in this dynasty. In the first year of the reign of Emperor Yongle, the capital of the Ming Dynasty was in today's Nanjing, the ancient capital of six dynasties, a city that was regarded as having the quality of an emperor. It was the founder of the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, who had chosen this site as the capital of his dynasty and he had built an imperial palace on it, the essence of all palace architecture in China over the past 2000 years could be easily found in this imperial palace. And although the palace today is in ruins, the loftiness of its design and construction can still be readily discerned. At this time, Beijing was nothing more than a site of a provincial administration commission named Beiping, and its population was small. But earlier, at the age of 11, Zhu Di had been conferred with the title of Prince of Yan, so he and his followers were very familiar with this area and cherished good feelings toward it. On the thirteenth day of the first month of the lunar year in the first year of the reign of Emperor Yongle, Zhu Di the Emperor offered sacrifices to heaven and earth, and after that he returned to the Nanjing Imperial Palace. When he and his ministers gathered together, Li Jigang, the person in charge of the Ministry of Rights, put forward a proposal saying, I think Beiping is a place where your majesty can carry forward the dragon throne, so it is suggested that your majesty follow the old system of designating another city as the capital, with Nanjing being designated the secondary capital. Emperor Yongle happily accepted the suggestion on the spot and within hours of the proposal being made, an imperial edict was promulgated, bequeathing on Beiping the new name Beijing and designating it as the second capital of the Ming Dynasty. Within a short time, this news reached every part of the country, along with the understanding that a great palace would certainly come into being as a result. Not 
Not long after he ascended the throne, Emperor Yongle issued this imperial edict, expressing his philosophy on ruling the country. The virtue of heaven is so great. The emperor of the people will follow the law of heaven and love his people. The territory is so large that it is not possible for one man to rule it alone. So it is necessary to find able and virtuous persons to rule the territory together. They will do their own job and contribute towards the well-being of the people. In light of historical materials available, it is clear that in the year 1403, Zhu Di was in a delicate and restless state of mind. As an emperor who had taken over the throne from his nephew, he had a great number of difficult problems to face. Among these problems were ministers of former Emperor Jianwen who were against him, and he needed to be rid of them permanently. After having killed a substantial number of people, Zhu Di felt very uneasy and asked one of his ministers, Ru Chong, might I have offended heaven and earth and the ancestors by doing this? Perhaps more disturbing for the emperor was the fact that the emperor Jianwen had been his nephew and that he had mysteriously disappeared during a big fire after Zhu Di and his troops had fought their way into the city of Nanjing. No one knew for sure whether Emperor Jianwen was dead or alive. Zhu Di had held a very grand funeral for his nephew as the Son of Heaven, but historians of later generations believe that the body buried at that time was not the body of Emperor Jianwen, and that in all likelihood Emperor Jianwen had escaped and was still alive. Perhaps it was this that was weighing very heavily on Zhu Di's mind. Then sometime later when he was holding court one day, Zhu Di narrowly escaped death when Jing Qing, his censor-in-chief, attempted to assassinate him. From the time of that event, Zhu Di had nightmares living in the city of Nanjing and quite probably began to miss Beijing, where he had been Prince of Yan more and more. Standing in the ruins of the Nanjing Imperial Palace, it is easy to imagine that Emperor Yongle, after having lived in the north for so many years, no longer enjoyed living so much further south in Nanjing. It was likely that he began to contemplate the possibility of moving the primary capital to Beijing in the north. While holding court in May of the same year, Zhu Di said to his ministers, Beijing was the place where I was conferred with the title of Prince Yan, and the god of the land and the god of grain are still there. So Beijing will enjoy the status of capital. His ministers, however, were strongly opposed to his plan. Knowing there was such opposition to his plan, Zhu Di became more cautious and began to make systematic and meticulous preparations to move the capital to Beijing in a more roundabout and secretive way. In 1403, many southerners from Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces were suddenly seen to be active in the city of Beijing. They had received permission from nothing less than the imperial government to live in the city and were to be spared from paying taxes for five years. These people, who were already comparatively wealthy, began to do the same business in Beijing as they had been engaged in in the south. At the same time, many peasants began to till the land and grow crops in the suburbs of Beijing. A large-scale migration project was well underway. At this time, when large numbers of people were migrating to Beijing, thousands of kilometers away in the northwestern grasslands, the Mongolian conqueror Tamerlane, along with his cavalrymen, began to head for the central plains, placing the northern part of the Ming dynasty in danger once again. But then, just as Emperor Yongle was about to deploy defenses and prepare for battle, 
During his march to the plains, Tamerlane died of illness, and the great conflict was avoided. In June 1405, when the wind was blowing from the northwest, Emperor Yongle dispatched one of his eunuchs, Zhang He, to lead a fleet in an extraordinary ocean-going expedition. The chief purpose of this voyage was to show the world the power of the Ming Dynasty. Although, it has also been said that one of the purposes of this voyage was to find the whereabouts of missing Emperor Jianwen. In August 1406, as the fleets led by Zhang He was still sailing, an event occurred in the Imperial Palace in Nanjing that made Zhu Di very happy. We have no way of finding out whether this recurrence was hint from Emperor Yang Le, or whether it was the result of guesses made by his ministers as to what was in the Emperor's mind. But whatever the case, a group of ministers headed by Chiu Fu suggested that a new palace be built in Beijing. Emperor Yongle very gladly accepted the suggestion. And so with this, a huge construction project began. Emperor Yang Lu began to dispatch his favorite and various trusted individuals all over the country as part of preparation for the massive project. Among them were Song Li, Minister of the Board of Works, Shi Kui, Junior Vice Minister of the Board of Official Personal Affairs, and Gu Pu, Senior Vice Minister of the Board of Revenue. Their destinations were the mountains of Sichuan, Hunan, and Hubei. Their task was to acquire wood from Nanmu trees. These precious Nanmu trees grew in dangerous locations in virgin forests, where tigers, leopards, snakes, including boa constrictors, were abundant. But officials and commoners alike went into the mountains to cut down Nanmu trees regardless of the dangers, and many lost their lives. Later, the cost of obtaining Nanmu wood was described in this way. A thousand men went into the mountains, and only five hundred came out. This is the interior of the Hall of Supreme Harmony in the Forbidden City. It was Nanmu wood cut down at that time that was used to make the pillars in this hall. But the huge Nanmu wood cut during the Yonglu period cannot be seen in the Hall of Supreme Harmony today. The huge pillars seen now were pieced together with pine wood in the Qin Dynasty. This footage from June 2004 shows one of the wood transportation tasks being undertaken during renovation of the Imperial Palace. Transporting the huge timber here using modern means of transport, it was difficult enough, so how then were quantities of Nanmu wood several times larger transported to the Forbidden City 500 years ago? Song Li, Minister of the Board of Works, had been dispatched to Sichuan, and later he described a memorable scene to the Emperor. One day, there were torrents of water in the mountains, and a large block of wood was swept down in the flood. But in its way, there was a huge rock. The large block of timber made of thunder-like noise as it bashed into the rock. But the rock was split in two while the wood remained in good condition. Afterwards, Emperor Yongle conferred the name Divine Wood Mountain on the place where this event took place. Most of the timber from the mountains in Sichuan, Guizhou, and Hubei was transported to Beijing via natural rivers and completed canals. It 
It was said that lumbering work for the new palace during the Yonglu period lasted 13 years. Similarly, the work of excavating rock for the construction of the palace was also very difficult. Behind the Hall of Preserving Harmony, we can see the biggest carved stone ramp in the Imperial Palace, carved from one piece of stone in the Ming Dynasty. But how were huge slabs of stone like this one transported here? According to historical records, these slabs of stone came from the southwestern suburbs of Beijing, more precisely from Daoshuo and Fangshan and Qingbaikou and Mengtoko. During the 600 years of the Ming and Qing dynasties, huge slabs of white marble were excavated from these two places, and even to this day, the extraction of white marble from these sites still continues. Historical records of the Ming Dynasty tell us how this big stone behind the Hall of Preserving Harmony was excavated and transported to Beijing. More than 10,000 laborers and 6,000 odd soldiers were involved in its excavation, but transporting it to the city of Beijing was even more difficult. Tens of thousands of laborers widened the narrow roads, filled in pits, and every 500 meters or so dug a well. In the depths of winter, when it was freezing cold, water was drawn from these wells and poured onto the roads, transforming them into icy pathways that made it easier to transport the stone. Twenty thousand laborers urged on more than one thousand mules to move the stone, and it took twenty-eight days to get it to the capital city. Enormous efforts were made to transport other big stones to the Forbidden City as well, and most of these big stones were used to build the road that was to be used only by the Emperor along the central axis of the Imperial Palace. According to studies carried out by experts and scholars of today, the preparation of building materials for the construction of the palace lasted for nearly 10 years. During these 10 years, Beijing gradually became the largest and busiest building site within the territory of the Ming Dynasty. These 3D animations indicate the location of the building sites within the Forbidden City at that time. Interestingly, some names given to the sites are still used today. Yet even though this was such a huge project, only a very small number of people are mentioned in the historical record. It was said that at the time, the number of artisans working on the construction of the palace totaled more than one million. Among them were a few lucky ones whose names have been passed down to the present day, and Wang Xuan and Hu Liang, artisans from Shanxi, were two of them. One day, when Emperor Yonglu was inspecting their building site, he noticed their colored drawings. The Emperor put his hand on Wang Xuan's shoulder and praised him, speaking highly of his skills. In 1406, Shen Gui, the Marquis of Taining, was appointed general director in charge of the reconstruction of Beijing City and the construction of the palace. In a decree to Chen Gui, Emperor Yonglu wrote, You should be kind to the soldiers and laborers on the building sites, and efforts should be made to make regular hours in terms of meals, work, and rest. Laborers should not be made to overwork. You should take my concern for the common people into consideration. 
Shen Gui worked as the supervisor until his death in 1419, before the completion of the Forbidden City. According to historical records, more than 20 of the skilled craftsmen and artisans involved in the construction of this project were promoted, and one of these was Jin Hung, an old carpenter. The names of a number of others were also recorded, such as Lu Qiang, who was in charge of stonework, and Sai Qing, who was in charge of craftwork. This is Zhong Nun Hai in today's Beijing. Before the completion of the Forbidden City, now more than 600 years ago, Zhu Di's mansion of the Prince of Yan and also the temporary palace before the Forbidden City was completed were located in the northwest of this district. In 1409, Zhu Di lived here in the name of carrying out imperial inspections. In fact, he lived in Beijing for five years and eight months between 1409 and 1421, and this caused the decision-making military and administrative systems of the Ming Dynasty to gradually move northward. A painter named Wang Fu followed Zhu Di to Beijing and painted eight great sites of Yanjing. In it, he depicted the beautiful landscapes, local conditions, and customs of Beijing with fine, smooth strokes of his painting brush. From this time on, Beijing gradually became prosperous. The migrants and military families stationed in the suburbs of Beijing opened up the wasteland, causing the level of agricultural production in Beijing to improve rapidly. And over time, Beijing became more and more important to this dynasty. During the period from 1410 to 1414, Zhu Di based his troops in Beijing and twice passed the Great Wall to fight in person, defeating the Mongol tribes who had been a threat to Beijing for many years. After one victory, he reviewed the huge number of troops under his personal command. Beginning of his attempt to move the primary capital to Beijing, the person dearest to the emperor passed away, his first wife, Empress Xu. No other person than Zhu Di's father, Zhu Zhuan Zhang himself, had been the matchmaker for this marriage. So how should he go about burying his first wife? The tomb was supposed to be built in Nanjing, but Zhu Di secretly dispatched a minister and a geomancer to Beijing to look for a propitious place to build the tomb. Two years later, Zhu Di issued an imperial edict that designated a certain location as forbidden to tombs. This location was 10 kilometers north of the town of Changping, and today this area is known as the Ming Tombs. Zhu Di's decision to build a tomb for Emperor Xu in Beijing was recognized by his ministers as a signal of the emperor's intention to move the primary capital to Beijing.
After this, a number of ministers began to submit written statements to the emperor in which they straightforwardly expressed their objection to their hinted intention of moving the primary capital to Beijing. But before long, Zhou Wenbao and Wang Wenjin, provincial administration commissioners in Henan, and Chen Zhou, an assistant administration commissioner, were exiled to the countryside to work as common peasants. Not surprisingly, having witnesses, the other ministers decided to keep silent on the emperor's intentions. One day in November 1416, Zhu Di convened his civil and military ministers to discuss a sensitive topic regarding Beijing. While wearing a kind and pleasant countenance, it seemed the emperor was being unusually democratic with regard to the construction of the palace in Beijing. And this time, there were no objections among his ministers. Instead, all of them agreed that the construction of the Forbidden City should be started as soon as possible. By now, they were all speaking highly of Beijing, referring, for example, to its excellent geographical position, and they were even strongly requesting that the primary capital of the Ming Dynasty be moved to Beijing. They said, Zhuyung Guan Pass is located to the north of Beijing. The Taihang Mountains lie to the west of Beijing. Shanghai Guan Pass lies to the east of Beijing. And the Central Plains are located to the south of Beijing. Fertile fields stretch for hundreds of kilometers, and the mountains are lofty and the rivers are beautiful. By basing the capital in Beijing, it will be easy to control all the territories and rule the country. Beijing is truly a capital of emperors. By establishing the capital in Beijing, the dynasty will last forever. Up until now, Judy has racked his brains over the issue of making Beijing his primary capital but suddenly it had become the common wish of both the emperor and his ministers. Later, historians consider that his decision resulted in the moving northward of China's political center. And from this time, the geopolitics of China began to change, and that this change influenced China's political pattern for several hundred years, with its influence still being felt today. On the early morning of April the 10th, 2005, a group of workers could be seen within the walls of the Palace Museum. They had come to conduct a large-scale repair and renovation work on the palace, and the project set to last 19 years. Some 600 years ago, 100,000 craftsmen and artisans had gathered here to begin building this palace. Most of them had come from such places as Hunan, Chendong, Chanxi, and Anhui. But today, we have no way of knowing exactly how they built this palace, and we have no way of knowing what their experiences were. Formal records of the construction of this palace and the records of the Ming Dynasty read simply as follows. In the year of Guihai, the construction of Beijing city began. The architectural styles of all temples, palaces, and gates were the same as those in Nanjing, but they were higher, brighter, and more magnificent. In the year 1419, the construction of this palace could only, of course, be recorded in writing. But today, we are fortunate enough to have video cameras. From these video clips of the repair and renovation project, we can get some idea of what a construction scene may have been like 600 years ago. Certainly, we can't help questioning the reliability of some historical records to quite some extent. In the same records of the Ming Dynasty, we find, for example, this record. The construction was started in the sixth month of the 15th year of Emperor Yongle. 
Today, some researchers citing this record as evidence maintain that it took just three and a half years to finish the construction of the Forbidden City. Other scholars, however, hold the view that it would be impossible to complete such a huge project incorporating more than 8,000 bays of architecture within three and a half years, even today. No matter what controversy there is, however, one thing is beyond doubt. Ancient architectural engineering methods in China have remained almost unchanged through many centuries. Although the Forbidden City was built almost 600 years ago, some of the architectural techniques used in the construction of the palace are still used by today's craftsmen and artisans. These traditional techniques were generalized in the Qing Dynasty as being the eight great techniques, namely carpentry, plastering, stone cutting, bundling, earthwork, painting, color drawing, and paper hanging. The techniques here are being used in the repair and renovation project today, and they are almost the same as those used by craftsmen and artisans in the Ming Dynasty nearly 600 years ago. In 1420, the palace was finally completed. It was built on the old site of the Yuan Dynasty Imperial Palace of Da Du. The famous pavilion of Prolonged Spring was replaced by Jing Shan Hill, and the entire architectural group of the palace was extended southward and located in the central area of Beijing City, enabling it to become the new sacred place of the Ming Dynasty. The bricks, tiles, wood, and stone seen here, along with the colors and spatial layout, tell us something of the civilization and ideas of the Chinese people. Since 1420, 24 emperors and their wives, princes, and princesses lived happy or sorrowful lives here, and from that time wonderful moments in Chinese history began to be witnessed by the palace. The first year after the completion of the new palace was the year 1421. On this day in which the common people celebrated Lunar New Year's Day, Zhu Di held a grand ceremony to receive court congratulations on the completion of his newly built palace. After stepping onto the high and wide hall for paying tribute to heaven, his ministers paid tribute to him by kowtowing in front of him. Zhu Di and his ministers naturally felt excited when they saw how grand and magnificent the new palace was. Before long, spring came, and the artisans, laborers, and soldiers who had been working in Beijing for years, and even prison inmates, found their fate suddenly changed when the emperor issued an imperial decree reducing taxation, exempting services, and granting general pardons. It is said that after the palace was completed, Emperor Yonglu was so satisfied and happy that he asked to see an official surnamed Hu, who is said to have the ability to foretell the future. But when asked to foretell the future of the palace, the official answered, The palace will catch fire on the eighth day of the fourth month of next year. On hearing this, Emperor Yonglu was so enraged that he had the fortune teller imprisoned and said that if there were no fire on that day, the official would be beheaded. No one present had taken the words of the official seriously. 
caught up as they were in the festive mood due to being in the new palace. It was also at this time that Emperor Yang Lu dispatched Zhang He and his fleet on their sixth voyage. But on the 9th of May, 1421, the weather suddenly changed and thunder was heard. Suddenly, the palace was struck by lightning, and the three halls were on fire. Whether Zhu Di had asked the said official to foretell the future of the newly built palace or not is uncertain, and we have no way to find out. More than likely, the story is nothing more than a fiction. But the fire itself is recorded in history of the Ming Dynasty, which states, In the fourth month of the Gunze year, a fire broke out in the Hall of Paying Tribute to Heaven, the Hall of Overwhelming Glory, and the Hall of Scrupulous Behavior. The record is concise yet comprehensive, but it is no more than these few characters. The three halls that had been the result of almost 20 years' effort by so many people and a considerable monetary cost in utilizing vast amount of materials were burned to the ground just three months after they were put into use. To Ju Di, this was almost a fatal blow. He felt very sad and was devastated over the burning of the halls. However, it was the agony of his own self-doubt that made him more worried. Zhu Di next issued a decree to his ministers as follows. The hall for paying tribute to heaven and the other two halls have been burned to the ground. And I am frightened and at a loss. If there is something inappropriate in my behavior, you should point it out frankly so as to give me a chance to correct myself and ultimately to show my respect to the wishes of heaven. The Emperor's officials responded to Judy's solicitation for suggestions with no little enthusiasm, some even taking the opportunity to rebuke Judy for his craving for greatness and success, and even criticizing him for his decision to move the primary capital to Beijing. Shortly, Emperor Yang Le, in a state of fear, anger, and contradiction, made his ministers kneel down in front of the Meridian Gate and debate the matter. He even executed an official who had rebuked him. Before long, Zhu Di committed himself to eradicating hidden problems along his borders and launched the sixth military expedition against the Mongols. However, his health was becoming worse and worse. This emperor, who had already experienced so much war, unexpectedly fell off his horse. Emperor Yong Lu died at Yumu Chuan while on military maneuvers. The three halls which had been burned to the ground were not rebuilt during the reign of Emperor Yang Le. For two decades from the time of the fire, the central area of the Forbidden City, which used to be adorned in great glory, remained in black ruins.
Ten years passed very quickly. In 1436, the first year of the reign of Emperor Zhang Tong, Zhu Qichen became emperor. He was only seven years old when he ascended the throne, and he greatly admired his great-grandfather Zhu Di. Once on the throne, he accomplished one thing that his father and his grandfather had failed to accomplish, the reconstruction of the Forbidden City. In the autumn of the year 1436, the court issued an edict which read, The court orders Ren An, a eunuch, Xin Qin, a military governor, and Wu Zhong, minister of the board of works, to lead tens of thousands of soldiers to build nine gates and towers in the capital. Five years later, another official edict was issued stating that the three halls and the palace of heavenly purity and the palace of earthly tranquility would be rebuilt, and on the very day the edict was issued, the project was officially begun. One and a half years later, the rebuilding work was completed after having been postponed for more than 10 years. The dust had settled and the Forbidden City was now as fine as it used to be. And another imperial edict announced this to the people. The Forbidden City in Beijing had become the highest political center in the land, and it remained so during the Ming and Qing dynasties. This matchless masterpiece in the history of world architecture has been standing on this site for 600 years. It is, in fact, the biggest palace architectural group in the history of mankind, and it is now a recognized part of the historical and cultural heritage of all the people of the world. Over a period of hundreds of years, the Forbidden City had experienced disasters and undergone restorations time and again. But yet more important events were to happen here.